Hello and welcome to your THP online community. I'm Dallas, your online community pastor. Today, our lead pastor, Scott Etheridge, will be continuing our series, First Things First, with a message called First Give Thanks. We hope that this message not only encourages you, but challenges you. We firmly believe that the things spoken here on Sundays and Wednesdays are not just for those who are able to join us, but also for members of our THP online community. We have been talking about first things first, and for the last couple of months, we have been talking about how God desires for us to, to seek the first things. Like, what is the main thing in your life? What is the, the main premise? And we have talked about seek first the kingdom. We have talked about uh, first remove the log from your own eye. We have talked about first love the Lord your God with everything you've got. And the first things, like Jesus told us in the book of Matthew over and over again, first do this and first do that. And it created this context for us, which is like, what is the main thing in our life? And we have, we have continually had a quote over and over and over again throughout this process that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. That's it. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. When we begin to put second things into the first things, then everything gets messed up. When we get the priorities in our relationship messed up and we've got second things trying to make them the first things, then both of those things lose their power. And God gave us a, a, a roadmap of what our first things are to be. And so today, we wanna talk about first give thanks and our focus today is the will of God. How many of you wanna know the will of God for your life? Raise your hand. The will of God. If you ask most people, they will say, yes, I wanna know the will of God for my life. But normally when we say the will of God or we're pursuing the will of God for our lives, most of the time we either put a position or a location into the will of God. Like we make that first. So what is the will of God for your life? Well, I have a call of God on my life to, to preach, okay? Well, so does that mean the will of God is for you to be a pastor, evangelist, whatever? We're, we're trying to make it into this position or title. Like, what is my job going to be? Or what job should I have? Or who should I marry? Or where should I go to school? Or where should I live? All those things, we try to make that the first thing in the will of God. And all of those things are the second things. A position is not the will of God. It might be a part of the will of God for your life to work a certain job, but it is not the will of God for your life. There are specific things that God laid out in his word that are the will of God. We're given certain examples in the word of God of the perfect will of God, the good will of God, the acceptable will of God. How many of you know there's even a permissible will of God? God will allow you to make decisions on your own without him, and you might have a certain grace for that, but it doesn't mean that you're not gonna, you're not gonna have to deal with the fruit of that decision. How many of you know if you make a decision, believer or not, you're gonna have to deal with the fruit of that decision? Good or bad. That every decision we make, there is a consequence. That every decision that we make, there is something that's coming back to us, and it could be good or it could be bad, but in all of it, God allows us to know what his will is. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, you know, he's given a list of all these exhortations and he, is, he, is, uh, he has gone through, Paul has gone through so many different things. He's, he's talked about uh, the, the, the church at Thessaloniki. He's talked about their, their, uh, their good example. He's talked about how they have, how they have gone through trials. He's, he's talked about how he's encouraged by their faith and how he wants to see them. And he's talking to them about purity and order and all these things. And he comes to this the, to the end of this first letter, and he begins to lay out, I urge you, he says, I urge you. When somebody says, listen, I urge you, or they're, they're trying to put a focus on it, this is important. And he goes through all of these different things, and he gets to verse 18, and he says, in everything. Say that with me. In everything. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He says that giving thanks, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 
God is saying that, that the will of God is for us to give thanks. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God. This says we are to give thanks in everything, not for everything. See, I can give thanks in everything because God is there. Even in the most difficult times, if I just look and I listen, God is there. That I can give thanks in everything. Even though I may not like everything, I can give thanks when I'm going through it because God is going through it with me. Doesn't mean that I need to give God thanks for death or for disease, but in it, I can give him thanks, right? Because he is with me. He is with us in everything. John 6, 11, then Jesus took the loaves. And what did he do? He gave thanks to God and he passed them out to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish and they all ate until they were full. This miracle of multiplication is a result of the supernatural breaking into the natural. All they had was a few pieces of bread and a few fish. But in that, all of a sudden, Jesus blesses it. He gives God thanks for it. And all of a sudden, he starts distributing that which didn't exist moments earlier now is possible because Christ got in it. If you let God in your situation, then the impossible is now possible. If you don't allow God to get in your situation, then it's not possible. But you have to let him in. Sometimes we think that God is just out there and he, and he just thinks that he's welcome into our situations. Can I tell you, you have to invite him in. There are so many people in our world that think, okay, there's a God of the universe out there somewhere and he's just gonna look after me and he's just gonna be in everything I'm doing, but he's not going to overwhelm your own choice and decision. He needs to be invited. He needs to be welcomed. Well, how is God welcomed into my situation? Giving thanks. When I give thanks, I am welcoming God into my situation. When I give thanks, I am letting the God of the impossible get into my impossible situation. Because this miracle of multiplication, the supernatural breaks into the natural. And not only did God provide enough to feed 5,000, not including women and children, but there were 12 baskets left. Like there were baskets left for all the disciples then to, to partake as well. And then to even distribute. And we can even overlay that to the 12 baskets and the 12 tribes. Like God was saying, look, I'm more than enough. I don't want to just provide for 5,000 or 10,000 or 15,000. I'm the God of more than enough. I can provide for all my people. Yes. Giving thanks first enters any situation in the will of God, thereby activating faith for the supernatural. When you give thanks first, when you give God thanks first, when you enter into that situation, you are in the will of God. When you recognize him first and you give him thanks and you have a recognition of him, when you enter into that situation, you are in the will of God. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We've talked about that at the first of this year about how God takes every single thread, good or bad, and if we give it to him, that he'll use it in the midst of our tapestry to create this unbelievable picture of himself. Yeah. Acts chapter five, verse 40 and 41, it says, and they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles, beaten them, they commanded them they should not speak in the, in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council. Now listen, they had beat them just for saying and preaching the name of Jesus. They put them in jail and they beat them. And then they said, now don't go and say Jesus anymore. Don't preach Jesus. Don't teach Jesus. Now go. And it says, when they went, they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. Rejoicing, why? For they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Like they were given thanks for being thrown in jail and beaten. Like being in that situation, they gave thanks. Why? Because evidently we're doing something right. Come on, how many of you know that when you're doing something right, that doesn't mean that everything right is going to happen around you? 
Just because you do something right doesn't mean that everybody's going to agree with you. But thereby, you don't lose your character and integrity just because somebody might disagree with you. Sometimes you got to say what's what. If you want to keep your character and integrity, you're going to make decisions that people hate. Don't ever let that change your character or your integrity. Don't ever let that change the decision that you make. So many times, even in our own families, a little bit of pressure is applied and boom, we're just, we're done. And we get so frustrated, we don't even want to make a decision then. And what we are doing is, we're not just disparaging our own character and integrity, but now we're taking him out of the equation. Listen, our kids were very persuasive when they were little. How many of you know what I'm talking about? If you're a father and you have daughters, you know exactly what I'm talking about. One bat of an eye. Like sometimes with boys, it's just like, get out of here, you know. But those little girls come running in the room, and those eyelashes start going, and you hear that one word. Like, it doesn't matter how hard you are, when you hear daddy, it's like there were times I had to turn around and just be like, Woo. all right, girls. <laughs> I mean, I had to compose myself because it just starts, there's a persuasion that's there, but we can't allow those persuasions. You know how stupid it looked for Jesus to take just a few and go, hey, I'm going to feed everybody with this. But guess what? He didn't care what everybody thought, and it didn't change the fact that he was going to do this. Listen, if you believe in resurrecting the dead, and God tells you to pray for a dead person, how many of you know everybody's not going to agree with that? Does that mean that you need to step away from doing that then? No, if God said it, and you believe it, you need to do it. Well, what if God doesn't raise the dead? Well, if God doesn't raise the dead, that's on God. That's not on you. You did what you were supposed to do. That's a good word. We are now taking on the form of God ourselves to decide what we should and shouldn't do. And we're stepping out of the will of God. And the God of the impossible is not in our situation because we haven't welcomed him into our situation. And then we get mad at God for not being there. God is there, but he's not always welcome. Did you know that God's presence is everywhere? When Jesus tore the veil, now there's an access to the presence of God that every human being has. You guys understand that, right? It's not just going to to the temple on Sunday and now I have access to the presence of God. Everybody has access to the presence of God. Well, why is there evil all over the world and rampant if God's presence is everywhere? Because God isn't welcome everywhere. But God is everywhere. Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious, wow, this is such a great word for our generation. Be anxious for, be anxious for what? Be anxious for Black Friday. You guys knew it was coming. Be anxious for Christmas time. Be anxious for the new year. Be anxious, be anxious for nothing. But in everything. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with what? Thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. So he's equating prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving with the peace of God. When you give God thanks, in everything give thanks, there is a peace that comes upon you because there is no weapon formed against you that shall not prosper because in everything, no matter if it's your best day or worst day, you're gonna give God thanks. The enemy can't deal with that. John, the enemy can't deal with that. So many times we're worried about the enemy's gonna do this and the enemy's gonna do that and the enemy's gonna do that, but in everything give thanks and he can do nothing with that. Like if the worst thing in your life has happened to you, but through it, you're going, God, I'm gonna give you thanks because I know this is just a season. This valley's just for a moment. I'm about to come on the other side. And when I come out the other side, there may be somebody who's about ready to come through the valley and I'm gonna be able to go to them and go, hey, here's how you get through. 
Come on, God, I may be in the middle of it, but I know I'm just in the middle of it. The end is coming. God, I may be at the beginning of it, but I know there's a middle and I know there's an end. It's not going to go on forever. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Stop containing the will of God to a position, a title, a job, a person, a location. There are people who feel like they're called to be missionaries to India and they won't even reach out to anybody for Jesus right here in Shreveport, Louisiana. Why is God going to use you in India if he can't even use you? You're not even welcome in Shreveport, Louisiana. You see how we have contained God. We have just mashed him into this small little box. Philippians said, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Colossians says it this way. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Colossians 3 says this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In Psalm 100, we've written songs about this psalm. We've sung these songs. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with... What were the gates? That's the first thing. The courts weren't first. It was the gates. It didn't say enter the gates with praise. It says enter the gates with what? Thanksgiving first and then enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him. Bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Ephesians 5. You say, this is a lot of scripture. It is. It's a lot of scripture. Not apologizing for that. You don't need any more quotes or movie illustrations today. You need the word of God. Come on. All right. Ephesians 5, 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It says that you're unwise if you don't understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It doesn't say singing well. Come on, somebody. It says making melody in your heart to the Lord. How many of you know that making melody sounds different in different hearts? And it also sounds different in different ears, right? And so what does he say after this? Giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. He says, understand what the will of the Lord is. And then he goes in and says, giving thanks as if it's tied, as if it is the will of God. Romans 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. A lack of thanksgiving puts your eyes on man rather than on God. The word of God is saying that when you get into this place of ungratefulness and unthankfulness, you create graven images unto yourself. Like you're lifting up other gods rather than the one true God. We could name a hundred reasons to be thankful, but the main reason today is that it is, it is the will of God. You may say, well, why should I worship him today? Why should I give him a radical praise on a day like this? Why should we enter his gates with thanksgiving and then enter his courts with praise? It really is pretty simple today. He forgives. Like, why should I give him praise? He forgives. Psalm 103.3, 
who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all my diseases. Can I tell you today that in his forgiveness is enough compassion to love us. There's enough grace to save us, enough victory to protect us, enough wisdom to teach us, enough glory to crown us, enough spirit to empower us, enough presence to encourage us, enough promises to assure us, enough joy to delight us, enough benefits to provide for us, enough peace to calm us, enough abundance to supply, enough power to resurrect, enough manna to feed. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Secondly, he heals. Is there anyone here today that can testify and declare that Jesus Christ is still a healer? There's a few of us. Is there anybody today that can say he's a healer today? He is a healer. It doesn't mean that sickness doesn't come. It doesn't mean that disease doesn't come. It means that when it comes and when we are in it, we can give thanks because he's in it too. He's in it to win it. Come on. So why aren't we? So many times I think we're in it just to be in the game, but not to win. The enemy's not playing a game. He wants to destroy us. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Why does the enemy want us to be ungrateful? Because if we're grateful and we give thanks to him, we are in the will of God. If we are giving thanks in everything, then we are in the will of God. And the enemy hates that. You know, the enemy doesn't care how many titles you have. He doesn't care if you're a pastor, an evangelist, a missionary, an apostle, a prophet, a teacher. He doesn't care. Actually, when you get that title, it opens a door to the enemy. The moment you get that title, it opens a door to the enemy. I've always told this to our young leaders. The moment you get paid to do what you're called to do is the moment a door opens to the enemy. Think about it for a second. I'm not just talking about ministry. I'm talking about anything. You're called to be a a police officer. The moment that you sign on the dotted line and you start getting paid for what you get called to, the enemy opens a door. There's an open door. The moment you get paid to do what you're called to do, the enemy now has access to use that title and to use that job to strip the calling away from you. There are too many pastors and evangelists and prophets and teachers and apostles, all that, police officers, firefighters, who are just getting a check and now it has become their job and they have lost their calling. Therefore, they have lost their passion. Therefore, they are no longer giving thanks for that which God gave them. Does that make sense to anybody? That's how the enemy robs us. That's how he, he, is, he is so sneaky. But I want to tell you that Jesus Christ, he forgives and he heals. He redeems. Psalm 103.4, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. We have experienced what's called a great exchange. And in that exchange, we gave God just filthiness. And he gave us freedom. And he gave us liberty. And he gave us holiness and righteousness. He gave us goodness. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He gave us the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And what did we give him? Just our filthy rags. Like here, God, I've messed it all up. This is yours now. And God go a bloody mess. <laughs> and God goes, okay, all right. You ready? Do you want to invite me in now? Well, wait a second, God. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for you to invite me. No, I've already told you, come to me, all you who are heavy. Like he's already given the invitation. He's waiting for us to invite him. And he says, are you ready today? Are you ready today to invite me? Well, you're the God of the heavens and the earth and the universe. Why do I have to, why do, why do I have to invite you in? Why can't you just do it? Because I love you enough to give you a choice. Will you invite me in? But wait a second, God, I thought it was much easier than this. Like, I, I just want the benefits. I just want the benefits. Like, I can read Psalm 103 and it talks about your amazing benefits. That's what I want. 
Okay. But you got to invite me in. And if you invite me in, here's what it's going to mean. And how many of you know that when we begin to think that way, the enemy hates what that means? Like when we invite God in, the enemy hates the result of that. Listen, our redemption alone is enough to give him thanks. But the last thing I want to tell you today is he satisfies. In that same Psalm 103, verse 5, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. See, there's no other shepherd who is so caring. There's no other physician who heals every disease. There's no other source that you can go to that's so dependable. There's no other fountain that you can go to that's so refreshing. There's no other peace that's so reassuring. There's no other help so reliable. There's no other deliverer who delivers so completely. There's no other authority that is so final. There's no other guide that's so sure in where he's going. There is no other light so bright. There's no other counselor so wise. Nor is there any other touch you could ever have in your life that is so comforting than the touch of God. What's the first thing for us? We just went through what we would call Thanksgiving. I think the question would be to most people, were we really thankful? Or were we just grateful that we had time off? We didn't have to be around the same people anymore. We got to get out of school. We got to take a day off. We got to be with our extended family maybe. We got to travel, but when we got back, we complained about the travel. We wanted to spend time with our family. We were with our family, but then we complained about being with our family. We went on vacation, but when we came back, we needed to take a vacation from vacation. See how self works? Self allows us the opportunity to be ungrateful actually for the things that we wanted in the first place. See, that's why we need to watch out for what we ask for because we may actually get it. Well, if I could just get this, everything would be fine, right? If I could just have this, I would be satisfied. How many people say, if I could just win the lotto once, it'll all be good? Now, you guys know the percentages, right? The percentages are, are astonishing. It's not like 7% or 10% or 20%. The percentage is almost in the 90s of lottery winners who within five years end up either where they were before they got it or worse. Five years, almost 90%. If money was it, then they would be far beyond where they were when they started, right? Right? It's because it will never satisfy. You wanted it and you got it, but you didn't want the responsibility of the decisions when you get it. How many of you know if you win $10 million, you're going to find out you have a huge family? Right? You got a ninth cousin somewhere who's about to call you. You're about to get a message on Facebook, right? Or somebody is going to say, well, you know, for Christmas this year, since you did so well... Right? And then you're going to have to be responsible for no. Right. See, in none of that is there any giving of thanks. But there's only thinking about me. When we give thanks, we step into that place of being able to walk in the perfect will of God. Without thanks... You can't walk in the perfect will of God. Without giving thanks, you can't step into that place of satisfaction, being satisfied. Why? Because if you don't give thanks, then you're not welcoming him there. And if he's the only one who can truly satisfy, if he's not welcome, you'll never be satisfied. Amen? Amen?
That was a lot. But that's okay. First, give thanks. That's where it's at. I want the team to come up. I want you guys to... Uh, I want you guys to go into that came to my rescue. And just for a moment, we're going to pause and just give an opportunity. I know that uh, during our time of, of worshiping during song, that the Lord kept showing me, just showing me uh, people, not faces, but just people that needed to call to him today. And he could come to your rescue things you've been stressing about, things that have been happening in your body, things that have been happening in your mind. And today he's given us kind of the, the blueprint of how to welcome him, welcome him in properly. And that is to give thanks. Like he's given it to us. He said, okay, here, here's the treasure. In everything give thanks for this is my will. That's your step today. And that's you welcoming me. That's what God says. That's you welcoming me by giving me thanks, by recognizing who I am. And you invite me in, and guess what? I come. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this portion of our series, First Things First. Here at THP, we often pray for household salvations in our services and our prayer meetings. If you would like for us to add your family to the list of families that we're praying for, please contact us via social media or email us at mediahub at thpshreveport.com. Our desire is for people to be who God created them to be, to know what God is saying, and to do what God says. For more information about The Healing Place, please visit our website, www.thpshreveport.com. THP Shreveport.com. Thank you for being part of the online community of The Healing Place.